and welcome my merry band of osatters to this which is actually the 76th podcast episode uh episode of the Soptician podcast um oh, it's not going very well already is it um last time i mistakenly numbered the episode number 76 when it's actually the 75th one so this is the 76th episode of the podcast um and my name is nathan taylor coming to you from somewhere in north london uh and uh this is the sock petition podcast because i've known sock petitions going ever so well um <clears throat> The reason why it's going ever so well is because my brain is not quite functioning on all cylinders because I've been ill. <laughs> yes, uh, so there's lots and lots of things I want to talk about today um, and hopefully you'll find it my interesting burble and blether is going to be a, a, a nice antidote to the, uh, the situation that a lot of people are finding themselves in at the moment, which is, of course, due to the coronavirus tragedy and uh, events that are unfolding around the world, a lot of people are finding themselves in isolation. Um, and I want to do a little bit to sort of uh, assuage that unpleasantness, if you like. Um, so buckle up, this one's going to be a bumpy ride. My brain is not working on all cylinders. Uh, you can probably hear my voice is a little bit croaky as well. Um, so, But I thought uh, the last thing I want to do is give in to that. I would rather carry on and push through it and do what I can to try and entertain you. So uh, grab a drink, grab some knitting. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get quarantine ball and let's see what's going on. So... As you will remember, um, if you are keen podcast watchers, last time I spoke to you, I mistakenly said uh, that it was the 76th episode of the podcast, when it's actually the 75th last time, but I talked about the number 76, so this time I'm going to talk about the number 75, right? Because um, it's really interesting, I, I jokingly said at the last one, as it was, no one's really interested in the numbers or no one's telling me, well, Lots of you, loads and loads and loads, have come back and said, I really, really enjoy the numbers. It's numbers and knitting. It's great. It's a really nice thing to do. So I'm going to continue with the numbers just because it makes me happy. Um, and I'm going to talk about the number 75 this time. So what do we know about the 75? The cardinal number 75, it's ordinal, means it's the 75th. Um, it can be factorised by saying it's 3 multiplied by 5 squared. 3 multiplied by 5 squared. 5 squared, of course, being uh, 25. 5 times 5 is 25, and multiply that by 3, and you get 3 times 5 squared, and that's 75. Um, the number 75, <coughs> excuse me, the number 75 is divisible by the numbers 1, 3, 5, 15, 25, and 75 itself. So it's got quite a lot of divisors there. Um, the Roman numeral LXXV is 75, L being 50, of course, X being 10, so L, 50, plus 10, plus 10, 70, plus V is 5. Um, I just, I'm really glad we binned Roman numerals. I like them, I like, I think they're great and everything, but I don't understand how anyone did any maths with Roman numerals. It must have been an absolute nightmare. Um, and then all sorts of other things there about numbers that I really don't want to go into. Um, but it is... <laughs> the slim pickings on 75 and Ben said well of course it's a big it's a big number it's, it's um it's an important number it's three quarters it's like it's not if you get 75 percent three quarters like yes it is but 75 itself doesn't mean three quarters 75 I guess just happens to be three quarters of 100 but 76 just happens to be three quarters of 104 <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, so apparently it is the fourth ordered bell number. Bell spelt with a capital B, so bell was somebody uh, very important clearly. Uh, now I looked at this, I don't want to start, I don't really want to start on a bad note, um, and, it says, and it says on Wikipedia here, it says it's the fourth ordered bell number and counts the number of weak orderings on a set of four items. Uh, I looked into bell numbers. <clears throat> I'm none the wiser, um, but apparently the number the the bell numbers are this: one, one, three, thirteen, seventy-five, five hundred and forty-one, 
4,683. And honestly, if you could see this page, it's something to do with plane trees. Um, the ordered bell numbers appear in the work of Cayley, 1859, who used them to count certain plane trees with n plus one totally ordered leaves, obviously. In the trees considered by Cayley, each root to leaf path has the same length and the number of nodes that... I mean... La, 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 I don't care. Um, so we're not, not going into the bell numbers today because my brain won't do it. There's some more fun stuff, though. It's at 75 is the sum of the first five pentagonal numbers. And uh, and therefore, it is a pentagonal pyramidal number. Now, that's a little bit more interesting, I think. So if I look up uh, pentagonal, pentagonal numbers, it's not just multiples of five. It's um, So if you draw... Um, a, a if you draw a pentagon where the length of every side is just I don't know how to do this really um <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to explain it really easily um so uh for, so the it's a pattern of dots if you think of dots the pentagon is, is five squares you know what um, the pentagon looks like right the, 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 the shape with five five sides um, so if you draw a pentagon, you've got five dots. If you go back one, then you've got one. One dot is the first pentagonal number um, because it's uh, it's the whole the length of the side is forget. It. But if you <laughs> but if you uh, if you have two dots representing the each side of a pentagon, so there's there's okay, so there's one. Okay, there's one side. And there's the next side, like that, and there's the next side there, and like that, and like that. <laughs> I'll try and make that work in the graphics. <laughs> so that's a pentagon where each side is two dots. So it's got one, two, three, four, it's got five dots in total. Now, if you share this one in the corner here, if, if you place another pentagon on the top, I might just borrow the graphic from... Uh, from Wikipedia because it's really good. It shows it all perfectly. Have a look at this. This this is these are these are your um, these are your um, one two three four five six pentagonal numbers. You see the building there. One two, and that works really really well. So those are the pentagonal numbers. Seventy five is not one. Do you ever wish you hadn't started something? <laughs> Oh dear Lord! Ah, um, so, <laughs> so, seventy-five is a pentagonal pyramidal number. It's not one of these numbers at all, but it's a pentagonal pyramidal number because it's the because pentagons are in five, and it's the sum of the first five of these. So, on the first five are one, five, twelve, twenty-two, thirty-five, and fifty-one. That's the numbers around there of the first five, and you add those up together. One plus si five is six, plus twelve is eighteen, plus twenty-two is forty, plus thirty-five is seventy-five. Ta da! Don't say I give you nothing. Um, now, seventy-five is also a nonagonal number. <laughs> People are switching off in droves. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so a non-agonal non number is the same sort of thing. So imagine uh, non meaning nine, of course. So if you if you've got that, do you remember that little diagram of the of the, the pentagonal numbers and how they all stack up next to each other? Um, like each one gives a, a, another ring around it. Well, imagine that with a nine sided shape. So a non-agonal number. The numbers are one nine. 24, 46, and 75. So it's not, you don't have to add any of those up. That's just, it's just one thing. I don't have a graphic for a non-agonal number. It looks a bit like a 20 pence piece. <laughs> Having said that, how many, how many sides are on a 20 pence piece? Is it seven? I'm gonna have to check. I've got some over here. Hold on a second. I've got my little, um, I've got a little ashtray. Now I don't, I don't smoke. I've never smoked in my life. But look, I keep 20 pence piece. For reasons 
I'll go into in a moment. I've been in isolation for a little while and I'm going slightly mad. Um, here is, here's a 20 pence piece. Talk about my ashtray in a minute. 20 pence piece, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> it's not even uh, accurately demonstrating uh, or depicting <laughs> Or illustrating what I was trying to say. Um, there are, there's a 20 pence piece for anyone who is not in the UK. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's very lovely. And <laughs> we're not all of our coins around. We've got 50 pence pieces as well. What's a 50? Is that nine? What have I got one in my pocket? I've got all sorts of things in my pocket. Um, no, I haven't got a 50 pence piece at all. Um, I'll check. Um, it's probably <laughs> so we've got this, the shape of that, it's a non hagrid number, great, marvellous. What else do we know? Oh, well, the, the fun thing is, um, you can work out a non agonal number quite simply with a little formula. So if you want to know what, for example, the fourth non agonal number is, there's a, a little um, formula which is n multiplied by seven times n minus five. So if you stick in brackets, okay, so let's do this. So we've got, um, we've got the brackets, and up in the brackets here, we've got seven n minus five. So if I want to work out the fourth non-agonal non number, that'd be seven multiplied by four is 28, minus five equals uh, 23. So we've got 23 inside the brackets, four outside the brackets, so n, yeah, see that there? So then, we, so if we work that out, we've got n multiplied by 23. So 4 times 23 is going to be 92, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 92. And then you divide the whole lot by 2, and that gives you 46. And 46 is a non-agonal non number. They are 1, 9, 24, 46, 75, 111, and so on up. Now, I think that's probably enough uh, about the non-agonal numbers, but let me talk about this. It's going to be a burbly, burbly time today. Don't worry about that. So if I um, get rid of all of my things, look at this lovely ashtray made from clay. I made that at primary school. I painted it myself. <laughs> a lot of the paint just went brown. <laughs> Um, it's got my initials on the bottom. Look at that. NG. <laughs> I'm amazed it came off the... It's not glazed, it's just painted. Um... <laughs> and do you know what we used to make a nice flat bottom? It had a big nail, like a masonry nail for banging into the wall. <laughs> And that's how I made it nice and flat. I made that when I was probably about five years old. This is 40 years old. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's remarkably, it survived entirely unscathed and unscratched. And I now keep it. I use it for putting my uh, 20 pence pieces in. It doesn't hold very many. <laughs> um. I'm a little bit worried about my brain. Um, what I am enjoying, though, is some freshly squeezed orange juice. Ooh, yummy, 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 uh, which is absolutely delicious. And I know it's freshly squeezed, because I squeezed it myself. Give me one of them. Um, so let's, uh, let's get rid of those numbers, shall we, and start talking about the things I want to talk about today. So I really want to talk, oh God, I can take my shoes off. Ben and I went for a walk earlier today. Um, we haven't been out much recently. Um, so <clears throat> I don't, don't know which, which is the best order to talk about all this stuff in, but uh, I have not been well. I have COVID-19. Uh, let me just lay that out there for anybody who is a little bit uh, worried about me. Please don't be. Uh, I'll come on to that in a second, but I do want to just talk about my experiences with the coronavirus. Um, I have been ill now for, this is day nine? 
nine, nine or ten, hard to tell really. Um, <clears throat> so a week ago, Saturday night, I started to get some little symptoms. I started to feel a little bit sort of shivery and a little bit tickly down here. Um, and then Sunday, I started to feel a bit ropey. Monday and Tuesday last week, it's, it's by the way, it's Monday today, the 20 something. Uh, it is Monday, the 23rd of March today, um, 2020. And uh, I, I started to feel really, really ill last week and it became very clear from the symptoms that I had that I do have COVID-19. I, I don't, <clears throat> I haven't been tested or anything like that. Uh, here in the UK, as far as I'm aware, currently people are only being tested if they're ill enough to be hospitalised and I certainly haven't been that. Um, it's, but it's, 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 not, it's been a bit of a bumpy ride, I have to say. So I had um, night sweats and, and fever and, and all of the, the nasty symptoms that go along with a fever. Um, so I, I, the, the, the aching in all my bones, my headache was constantly was present. My eyes have been aching a lot. So if I look at the extremities of any direction with my eyes, that aches a lot. Um, I my skin has felt like sandpaper, so all the uh, all my clothes feel really really scratchy. Um, and getting into a, get, if I if I got cold, I would just be really really shivery and horrible. So all the classic symptoms of a high temperature. Unfortunately, we don't own a thermometer, um, and I haven't been able to take my temperature because because Ben went out to five different pharmacies the other day, and no one's got any temperature uh, any thermometers at all. So that's uh, it's it's really. It's kind of hard to to maintain uh, any sense of of living in the real world when the world has got a little bit mad. Um, so, so I I put myself into complete isolation all of last week, and uh, for seven days I didn't leave this flat. It oddly, it was just at the point where. London was was going into shutdown and uh, and the the UK particularly going into shutdown. Um, now I the reason I'm fairly convinced it it's it is what it has been is because I was the week before I got ill I was in central London a lot I was using the tube a lot uh, I so I. It's hard. It's it's really hard to think of a chronology of, of all of this without giving you all the background. So um, I. I may just, might as well just dip in then. So some of you will remember back in November, I did a uh, a secret singing job. And it's a television job. I still can't talk about it, but we've done it again. Um, and this, this is for developing uh, and workshopping and showcasing a new format for a TV show, which has a lot of music in it. Um, so if you imagine, for example, if you look at Strictly Come Dancing or Dancing with the Stars, um, there's the house band, so there's a live band in the show which has its group of singers who sing at the microphone and, and they're very much part of the show. Well, it's that sort of thing. And the two singers uh, were me and uh, a very good friend, Laura Barnard. And uh, she and I did it together in November um, and we we were asked to come back to do some more developing work on the format and I'm really really excited by it. I, It's so much fun, I can't say any more about it because obviously it's all top secret and lockdown and stuff, but it, it, if it comes off, if, if one of the broadcasters decides that they do want to take it on, oh I really hope that I would be part of the actual show because it's so much fun to do. It's so silly, it's really really silly. Um, so anyway that's that's what we were doing and that was the Wednesday and the Thursday and in fact the week before that I'd been asked to go in and do some more development work um, just to workshop some of the new material because one of the the people who's working on it outside the band, but sort of one of the, the main focuses of the show, um, he was unavailable, so they asked me to stand in and, and do that for him, um, which I was more than happy to do, of course, uh, which is, which is, it's always nice to be, to, to feel that you're very useful as well um, to a company like this, so hopefully I did a good job. Fingers crossed, hope I didn't uh, annoy anyone too much. Um, <laughs> and sang really well and did all that. So anyway, Wednesday and the Thursday, 
we all got together, the whole team. So there were six dancers and the host and the band of four and the two singers. So there's quite a lot of people um, actually part of the performing aspect of it, but there were also gosh, so many runners and costume and wardrobe and lights and sound. And uh, it's just like, a, when you work in, when you're used to working like I am in theater, you get used to doing everything. Everyone runs around doing uh, a million d different things and there's only like five people and they run around doing everything. When you work in television, there are just millions of people. Really, really millions of people. Um, there were so many people, so many runners. I, there, was, there was a runner that was just sort of in charge of me and Laura, making sure that we had enough hot drinks or water or anything. Just like, um, I'd, I'm sure he was doing other things as well. Tom is very nice. At one point he said to him, would I like to get some water? He's like, I'm perfectly capable of getting my own water. I'm sure you're busy. <laughs> Give me the bottle. <laughs> I don't want to take away from his job. But I also didn't want to be that, that you know, oh, I have the talent. <laughs> That's not me at all. So uh, we all got on really, really well, had a lovely, lovely time doing it. Um, but it did mean, of course, I was in central London for two days in a row in vast groups of people um, using the, the underground restaurants, public toilets, and I was washing my hands religiously um, before and after anything. We were all being told as well, um, to literally one of the duties of one of the people who was there was literally just to say to everyone, if you haven't washed your hands the last 15 minutes, please go and wash your hands before we do the next section. Um, so we, we were really, really on top of it. Um, and then I met up with uh, a group of friends I say friends, I made friends, a new group of people to me. It's a, it's a WhatsApp social group that I've become uh, part of. I was invited to join, really nice group of guys. Um, and people were saying, oh, we're out in Soho tonight, so we want to come join us. So we went to uh, a local bar called Rupert Street, which is in Rupert Street. Um, and had a really nice time meeting people there. And it was just, again, that that was a social environment. And then a few days later, I got sick. So, of course, I was then having to tell everybody, oh, listen, just so you know, I've, I've been a bit poorly. Um, so all last week, essentially, was just sitting here, literally in this chair. I have the screen there, which I keep referring to. That's my, my Mac screen. What I normally do is I, I sit there and I, I have Netflix on and I watch one of my box sets and I, I carry on. Well, the weird thing is, self-isolation for me apart from doing the, the singing thing that's that sort of a, a rare one off usually my my weekly uh timetable doesn't look a great deal different from self isolation bill um and that's that's the that's the weird thing about it i've been i've been aware that the world has been gradually pausing around me and and ben's been ill as well um, so we've none, neither of us have escaped it, but we we've had sort of different sets of symptoms. So it's been difficult to to really track. Mine seems to have been more textbook, um, and now as far as I know for sure, there's there's two stages to COVID nineteen. There's the first stage, which is the high fevers and the sweats and the shivers and everything else. And then, he, then you can, it can go away for a couple of days or feel like you're getting better. And then it comes back. And that's usually when the cough comes in. And that's when if it's going to if it's going to turn into something nasty, it would be on that second section, which is your body's immune response to trying to fight it off. Um, now, I I'm in that zone at the moment. Um, so my voice is husky. I've, I've got a cough. You're not hearing me cough very much at the moment. I've been actively suppressing my cough and trying to make sure that uh, that I don't aggravate or irritate my respiratory tract, partly because I, I just don't enjoy coughing, but I also feel that if I start, I won't allow, I won't be able to stop. So I've been very careful about not coughing. Um, and uh, I've also got a lot of fluid in my eardrums, which is something I'm prone to whenever I get any kind of uh, any infection and it usually goes to my ears, usually my left ear, so I'm, I'm feeling a little bit deaf and a little bit cut off from the rest of the world and I, uh, <laughs> there we go, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> trying to stop and I am uh, short of breath, it doesn't take me very much 
activity to get winded. Um, so it's, it's all, it's, it's the, the classic symptoms. So no, I haven't been tested, but I am pretty certain that's what it is. Now that also leads me on to uh, the other thing which I really, really want to, to say to people. Um, thank you to everybody who has been really uh, concerned for my health mostly related to my HIV status. Well, I'm very glad to be able to tell you, thank you for the concern for a start, it's, it's really sweet and I, I do appreciate people thinking of me in that way. Um, but I want to disabuse you of the notion. The interesting thing is, uh, everyone is worried because um, we know that COVID-19 is more severe with people with underlying health conditions, underlying health conditions which include people with a compromised immune system. That's not me. OK, uh, it's I this is this is this is my HIV advocacy and awareness. What I really, really want to impress upon people is this fact. I don't have a compromised immune system in any way, shape or form. I really, really don't. Um, most people with HIV uh, are on effective medication. Certainly most people in the UK. I'm not I know that's not true for everyone else in the world, but certainly here. Anyone who's on medication, on effective medication, means that their viral load is fully suppressed. Uh, mine is undetectable. That means there are fewer copies of HIV genetic material per milliliter than 40. So it's lower than 40 and under that the tests literally can't detect it. So uh, what that means is my medication suppresses the virus in my body to such a level that it's not doing anything active. Now, the way, the way HIV works if in someone who's not taking medication, the virus can't replicate on its, on its own. This is HIV I'm talking about now, not, not coronavirus. Um, HIV can't replicate on its own. It needs to utilise, some people say attack, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't attack anything, it's just doing what it needs to do. So it's, it will utilise one of my CD4 cells. Now the CD4 cells happen to just be just happened to be a uh, one of the mechanisms of my immune system and it just so happens that there's a receptor on the CD4 envelope, the outside of it, which is the right shape for the HIV virus particle to latch onto. They grab onto each other and they, they sort of dock like that and then it can dissolve a little passage through and it can take its own genetic material and it can insert it into my cell's genetic material and splice it into the DNA of my cell and use that cell to then pop out new virus particles. That's what normally happens. Um, in the process of doing that, it'll release about 300 virions and then that cell will die. So suddenly 300 new particles go off and find a CD4 cell to go into and utilize and splice their genetic material into and pop out 300 new virions each. And each time they do that, the CD4 cell will die. So left unchecked, a lot of CD4 cells die. Um, and that means there aren't enough of them to, to do what they should be doing, which is, is protecting my body from pathogens and things like that and other infections. So that's, that's if you're not taking medication. I take medication, I take medication every single day, uh, and I take Raltegravir and Truvada, which is a combination of Raltegravir on its own, and Truvada is a combination of Emtricitabine and Tenofovir disoproxyl. I know. <laughs> um, but those three drugs that I take stop the virus from being able to do any of that. So what this means is, at the beginning of my infection, uh, when I first picked up HIV, Yes, my before I started treatment, there's only there's only about seven weeks, probably less, um, where my the virus was active in my body before I started taking the treatment. So I had the, had a massive spike in my viral load. So my my virus particles were replicating off the charts, and they were eating away at quite a lot of my CD4 cells. Now, anybody who has a compromised immune system would be considered to be somebody who has a CD4 count of less than 200. And again, that's 200 CD4 cells per milliliter of blood. 
To put it in context, a healthy CD4 count is considered to be somewhere between 600 and 1350. So that's quite a wide range, been quite high. So 200 is, is low, you know, really, really low, but, but a long way below 600. And that means you don't have enough of your immune system to be able to, uh, to look after you properly. Um, when I was first diagnosed, so remember I was, I was just, I was still seroconverting. So my seroconversion illness was still going on. So it's really, really early days and my, my immune system was taking a bit of a battering and my viral load was up out of, out of the charts. I can tell you what it was, it was 295,121. I look at it, I've got it tattooed on my arm there. <laughs> 295,121. Um, even at that point, my CD4 count when I was first diagnosed was 580. So it had only just dipped 20 below the lower edge of normal. And uh, my second and only other CD4 test was a couple of months later when I became undetectable, um, and it was 740. So it was already well back up. Now, and probably still climbing and probably still going and recovering. So the it just so happens, I tend, I, I believe that I'm somebody who has a naturally high, naturally occurring high CD4 cell count. So that means my immune system is naturally overactive. Um, not overactive, very, very uh, um, successful and good at what it does. Some people's aren't. Um, I, there's other things that tell me this as well. I, I, I don't have all the facts, but um, I have hay fever, which is an allergies can be a product of an overactive immune system um, where your body's fighting off stuff that aren't actually, are things that aren't actually gonna cause any problems in the first place, like pollens. Um, <clears throat> as well as the fact, I was really, 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 really ill when I got HIV. And that is, from what I can gather, if you have a high CD4 count, then your body's immune response to HIV is going to be big, and 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 all of that stuff is going to mean that I I will have responded to it in a much more severe way, which I did. So all of this leads me to think that I, I'll ne I'll never know, of course, what my CD4 count was prior to catching HIV, and I don't know what it is at the moment because it's not something that my doctors are going to look at until they until and unless they see other signs that they might need to investigate something but at the moment I'm completely fit and healthy so as far as as far as my doctors are concerned all is well and my last CD4 count was 740 so and, and probably still rising so I reckon it's probably above a thousand now um, which is on the it's really really high it's good all of that means my immune system is not compromised in any way so yes somebody who is has only just become infected with um, HIV or someone who's not taking medication, it is true their CD4 count will have taken a bit of a battering. Um, but even so, uh, I'm just going to bring up on, on my screen here the, the, uh, the current information from Beaver, which is the British HIV Association. Um, what does it say here? Uh, um, so this is this is from Friday. This is the latest, um, and this is so the so Beaver.org. Um, they are saying this is the joint statement on risk of coronavirus COVID nineteen for people living with HIV. This is from the European AIDS Clinical Society and the British HIV Association coming together to give the most up to date information they possibly can. So far, there is no evidence for a higher COVID nineteen infection rate or different disease course in people with HIV than in HIV negative people. Great, I'm literally at no higher risk of catching it than negative people. Current in evidence indicates that the risk of severe illness increases with age, male sex, and with certain chronic medical conditions such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Although people with HIV who are on treatment with a normal CD4 T cell count and suppressed viral load may not be at increased risk of serious illness, Many people with HIV have other conditions that increase that risk. Indeed, m almost half of people living with HIV in Europe are older than 50 years. I'm not. And, uh, and chronic medical problems such as cardiovascular and chronic lung disease are more common in people living with HIV. It has to be assumed that immune suppression indicated by a low CD4 cell, less than 200, which I was just saying earlier, or not receiving antiviral treatment will also be associated with an increased risk for a more severe disease presentation, disease being COVID-19. 
No data are available with regard to pregnancy or potential perinatal uh, transmission in the context of HIV. So uh, what they're saying is there's no more likelihood that someone with HIV who is on effective treatment will get coronavirus or that they will have a more severe response to it. So I don't need to worry about any of that notwithstanding the fact that I've already got it. But that's nothing to do with my HIV status, I promise. It's li literally just to do with the fact that I live in London and I'm an active person and it was always going to happen. Now, the interesting thing is as well, a lot of stories are out there saying um, that uh, the HIV medication is being used to treat coronavirus. Well, that's not entirely true. There are, there's there's one drug combination which was being looked at as a possible treatment for uh, coronavirus, and that was uh, the combination of lopinavir and ritonavir used together, it, which is sold as is, is a drug called Kalitra. Um, now, there's no information at all as, about whether or not it's been successful. It does say here there's ongoing discussion and research around some HIV antiretrovirals which may have some activity against COVID-19. The first randomised clinical trial with lopinavir ritonavir demonstrated no benefit over standard care in 199 hospitalised adults with severe COVID-19. There is no evidence to support the use of other antiretrovirals, including protease inhibitors. Indeed, structural analysis demonstrates no darunavir binding to COVID-19 protease. So, that means it, some people are saying, oh, if, if you're on medication, you're not going to get coronavirus. Well, none of that is true. So I just wanted to, I wanted to get that out of the way. So while I appreciate everyone's concern for me, um, be concerned in the way that you would when you hear that someone's a bit poorly, but don't, but don't, not waste, that sounds, that sounds really rude. I don't mean that, but I mean, it's, it's, it's Save, save your concern for, for somebody who, who might be at, at, at genuinely in a high risk category. So that's going to be people with um, cardiovascular disease, people with diabetes, people who are o over a certain age. I'm only 45. I'm fine, I promise. Um, so it's been, it's been a really interesting uh, ride. Ben and I are slightly climbing the walls. Um, we've only got each other's company. Um, but... The internet plays a big, big part in, in keeping people on the straight and narrow at the moment. And I think that's really, really important. So I, I've i long been a Zoom user for various, various different things. Um, and Zoom, if anyone, if, if people haven't come across it in the past, is a video conferencing piece of software kit, which is free to download from zoom.us, not on commission. Um, and and it means it's, it's video conferencing, so it's like webcamming. So um, you can have many, many people in. I've got a lovely big screen on my on my computer here, um, and you can have. It's it's like celebrity squares. Right? <laughs> Do you remember celebrity squares where you have different people in different boxes? But it's like that, and it, and you can all talk to each other, and you can all uh, coincide and interact, and uh, all in the same place at the same time. You can all hear each other. It's really, really lovely. So what I did last Thursday. I did. It, it was very spur of the moment, and it was. Um, I just sort of put it out on Instagram. I decided to host a Zoom room, um, and I posted the uh, the link to it on my Instagram bio. So, in on my bio, as a lot of people do now, I've got a link tree. So you click on my link, and I've got loads of different links. So there's the website. There's the there's my um, Ravelry page. There's Instagram. So you, you can find out all these things from my link tree. And it's just link linktr.ee forward slash saltmetician. You know all the links anyway. Um, but if you, it, it saves me updating my Instagram profile all the time. So the, I can, because I can always add different links to the link tree. So what I did was I put a link to the Zoom room on my link tree, which was accessible from my Instagram profile which is instagram.com forward slash saltmetician. If you haven't already, um, if you don't, if you're watching this and you don't follow me on Instagram, why on earth not? <laughs> I don't normally do this. I kind of let things happen organically, but I thought I might as well. Let's cross pollinate. So if you're watching this and you don't follow me on Instagram, then you might as well. So head over to Instagram and, and follow me there. Um, likewise, 
if you're watching this and you haven't subscribed to my channel here, then why would you want to miss out on all the stuff that I do? This is me burbling and talking. I'll carry on talking for hours and hours and hours. And let's face it, we've all got hours to kill at the moment. <laughs> um, so I, I put that information out with about 90 minutes to go. Um, and it wasn't, uh, I, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll do about three hours on the Thursday evening. And I had no idea who would turn up. Um, everybody was welcome, absolutely everybody was welcome, and it's not just knitters, it was crochets. In fact, it was lovely. We probably had about 30 people pop in and out uh, for, over the course of the evening, and at any one time there was usually about 18 or 20 people there. It was really, really lovely. Um, if you were there, thank you so much for, for coming and spending some time with me. It was, a lot of people have said that it, they, anyone who's being a bit isolated, that they felt a lot better and they, it was just nice to have company. Um, and I think these things are really, really important. If, if the world has gone, the world has changed over the last few weeks, it really has. And, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I don't believe it's all deliberate and that everything is happening because somebody said, oh, we need the world to change, we need to all come together. Well, coronavirus, is actually sort of doing that, um, I hope. Um, while it, it's isolating, it's also making people realise what's important, and what's important is community, and what's important is love and kindness, which is what I've always been about. And I, I was really, really heartened to see so many different people there. We had crochet going on, we had knitting, obviously, we had uh, tatting, and we had bobbin lace um all being all being done in the room and and we had a little we went around and and everyone had a chance to if they wanted to they could uh talk about what they were making and and show us online and everyone could ooh and ah and make all the right noises but it was just it was just really nice to sit there and chat and uh and not feel alone i did it because i didn't want people to feel isolated and i wanted to sort of reach out and say if anyone's feeling lonely then come and join me um and I think it made a big difference to a lot of people. So I'm going to be doing it again. Uh, today is Monday the 23rd of March, but uh, this coming Thursday, which will be, um, what's that, 27th? I can't do the maths. Uh, so Thursday the 26th. Thursday the 26th of March, I'll be doing it again. It'll be 8pm uh, UK time. Um, and I... I, I think that's 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and uh, 1 p.m. PST. <laughs> um, and obviously that means it's 9 p.m. on the continent. We It's difficult at the moment to know everyone's time schedules because of uh, daylight savings time. I know America is on it yet and we're not. Um, so, so I think New York is only four hours behind us at the moment. Um, but anyway, it's 8 p.m. UK time on Thursday the 26th of March. We're going to be doing it again. So head, the, the way to do it will be to go to my uh, Instagram account and go to my profile. And when you get to the Linktree page, you'll see it just says Zoom meeting. Um, if that's activated, then, then the room is open. And that's that's my plan. So uh, so from 8 p.m. till 11 p.m. So I'll be there for three hours. If anyone wants to join me, it's just a nice way of, of sort of building friendships and 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 all that kind of stuff. Now this is a knitting podcast, and I haven't actually talked about any knitting at all yet. Um, <laughs> you know me. Um, I. What else have I been doing? recently no nothing 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 else to talk about there um excuse me this is my godsend i love this this is so brilliant i can drink out of it or i can just pour it upside down and nothing comes out it's got a little button on it and the little button oh i love it <laughs> so most of the knitting that i've been doing at the moment has all been on the big poncho the last time you saw it on here, I don't think I even started the green stripe. I now have completed the green stripe and I'm part way into the blue stripe. And it looks like this. So it's getting, it is getting larger, most definitely. Um, 
it's enormous. I'm just going to open this door behind me because this uh, room gets very, very hot, and particularly if I I'm wearing this madness. So here we are, and now that I've got the blue stripe on it, you're really starting to get a sense. If I sit up here, actually, if I show you, it's getting huge. It really, really is. It's going to be enormous. It's already, already, I can stretch it down to my fingertips already, and I, so I've still got that much of the blue. It, it's, it is going to be colossal. Now that's very, very deliberate. Um, I absolutely wanted to make the largest poncho that I pro possibly could um, because I just wanted to make sure that it covers all bases in terms of size. Now the joy of this design is you can you can stop wherever you like. It just it just grows once you once you've from this point onwards. Once you've established the uh, the uh, the four stitch repeat. I'm just going to turn. Damn, there you go. Once you've, it's, a, it's too bright, isn't it? It's not going to work. Once you've established the four row repeat, you can just keep going and keep going and keep going. Um, it is already huge. Part of me is wondering whether or not I have slightly gone overboard with the size of it, but actually I don't think I do. I think it's, it's going to be lovely. It's, it's going to be somewhere sort of down around my thighs. And I think that's really lovely. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It really, really is. So here, the big old cowl neck. It's so cosy and so lovely, and it drapes so nicely. This is all done with the sock Petition edition yarn, obviously. I can't be breathless. <laughs> Did I dare to stand up? Um, it's all made with the sock Petition edition yarn, and as you can see, it's working its way through the colours of the rainbow. Now, interestingly, adding this little bit of blue to it has changed the emphasis of the colour palette completely. Without the blue, it felt very much like it was very autumnal colours with the red, the orange, and the yellow, even the green, it just felt very autumnal. But suddenly adding the, the, the cooler blue colour to that, it really does suddenly give you the, <clears throat> the extra dimension of it being a rainbow. So I've got uh, more and more of the blue to come and then finally there will be the darker purple at the other end so so this is this is what it's going to look like as you work all your way through now it's golly it's it's heavy it's hungry it's taking up a lot of yarn but i think it's so so worth it and i just i love i love this texture I think it's so exciting if I put this over here like that. I think it's so beautiful. This is this lacy sides going on here. This is just one pair of stitches, which gives you this this spine here, and that works all the way down. And then in between that, you've got all the uh, the the decreases. If you work your way through there, it's I it's so heavy. <laughs> It's so far, I haven't, I haven't added it up. Let me add, add this up. Um, so it's one, two, three, four, five, eight, nine. It's about, it's about 900 grams so far. Um, <laughs> it's very, very large. Um, and it's gonna get heavier and heavier and heavier. And I, I love it so much. I'm really enjoying knitting it as well. It's. I, I've, I've now, I haven't looked at the, uh, well, there is no real pattern. I just sort of, I've sort of sketched it out and I've got notes of what I've done, but it's literally just these four repeats. There's one, one repeat with, uh, well, sorry, one round where you're literally just doing brioche knitting, double, double knitted brioche knitting all the way around. Uh, the next round where you do the increases on all the increased rows, uh, or increase sections. Um, and there are 16 increases per row, so it's it's not. There's currently about 800 stitches, about 400 pairs of stitches per round, so it's taking a while. Um, and then the third round is is the decrease setup round, and then the the fourth round is the decreases and the increases together. So it's it's so so easy, and it's so intuitive. And obviously, as you're working your way around it, it's very, very easy to spot 
where the decreases have to be and where the increases have to be. But look at this all lacy stuff. It's just beautiful. Um, and then, of course, you've got the magic of being able to have it the other way out as well. And that's that's just glorious. So there we go. That's what it looks like if you wanted the much more muted version. It's still showing all the different colours. I... I'm in love with it. I really, really am. It's so, so blanketty and cosy. Um, it's just, just gorgeous. Um, so I thought rather than go, because that literally that is all I've been knitting. Um, I haven't done anything on anything else. So I, I thought I could probably uh, go through some other things because I know there's a lot of people who are new to this podcast a lot of new subscribers and a lot of people who are new on Instagram as well so if that's you brighter and brighter I thought by now that it's it, I don't normally record at this time of day it's two in the afternoon but it just seems so bright I I've never Sorry about that. Um, so I thought I could uh, go through some of the older things um, in my knitted heritage catalogue and, and show you some stuff that, that I find fun. Um, one of the things that I, I love talking about with my, uh, um, in my double knitting classes is this scarf. Obviously, nearly everything I'm about to show you will be double knitting of some kind either double knitted brioche or double knitting itself because eh, you know I am the dark lord of double knitting after all. Um, this scarf here is called Peano number no. one. If you haven't seen it before it looks like this. It's quite long. Um, I guess it's, well, it's certainly longer than I am tall. Uh, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just yeah, so I'm I'm six feet tall and it's that much above me. So it's about seven feet long um, and it's this wide and it's really, really thick and dense. I absolutely love it. It's seen a lot of wear, so there's quite a bit of pilling on this one. Um, but as you can see, it is uh, on one side, it is a blue wiggly line on a grey background. And on the other side, it's a grey wiggly line on a blue background. Now, I say this is called Peano number one. You'll have seen it on screen already. That is... Giuseppe Piano, and Giuseppe Piano was a 16th century Italian mathematician who who first described the concept of the space-filling curve. Now, hang on, Nathan. Um, sorry to interrupt, but you said curve, and I can't say curves. It's all straight lines and angles and, and right angles there, so corners, so curves. It, well, you may be interested to know that a curve, mathematically speaking, is defined as any line which is unbroken and continuous and doesn't cross over itself. So as it can be a curve as we would recognise it with an arc, um, or it can be any, with something with lines and with corners in it, but what matters is that it doesn't cross itself and it doesn't and isn't broken. So that's exactly what this is. And the whole point of this scarf is it starts here and the shape continues all the way, does this, and then it goes back on itself down here, and comes over here, and then it works its way this way, and then it starts going up here, and literally it will carry on going back over, making sure it covers every, so every little bit of the surface here, and it's only when it gets to here that it starts to take a jump up and it starts on the next section. Um, and it does that. The line is unbroken and continuous all the way through the entire length of the scarf. It's really kind of cool. It really, really is. It's, it's, it's a true labyrinth. Um, now, the, the space-filling curve, back to the maths, aren't we? The space-filling curve is the first example of what would later become called a fractal. If you haven't come across the word fractal before, a fractal is any mathematical shape which you could zoom in on it a million times or an infinite number of times and it always looks the same. Or you could zoom out on it an infinite number of times and it would also look the same as well. So that's, that's what's going on there. The reason why it's a fractal is because... Do you, uh, do you see this uh, 
just that little section there, the beginning of the grey line there, it looks like a baby capital N. Actually, this might be reversed. Maybe I should do it on this side. Okay, do you see that section there? It looks like a little capital N. Well, if you flip that N up that way, you get a backwards N there. And if you flip it up again, you get another one just there. But then instead of continuing up that way, you can flip it there like that, and you get that one. And then down and down and across and up and up. And what you've done is you've made a bigger capital N out of lots and lots of little capital N's. And that's the fractal nature of it. I find it fascinating. This is um, a DK weight yarn. It's the John Arbon knit by numbers. Um, and it's really, really dense and, and lovely. This, for anybody who is looking for a beginner's double knitting project, this is the one I usually recommend out of my own patterns. It, uh, it, Covered in bits. I wear this one a lot. Um, it is. Uh, it's very repetitive. This pattern, in terms, of, in a good way, because it means you're not always going to be a slave to the chart. If you notice, as you're working away across here, there's a whole a whole section, which is just two grey, two blue, two grey, two blue. As you work across this section there, and there's six rows, one after the other, where it's literally. Two of this colour, two of this colour, two of this colour. So if you're if you're worried about following a chart and if you want a little bit of practice of, of that, then this has got everything worked into it for that. And that's the piano number one. There is a piano number two as well, and uh, that is uh, one more complicated iteration of the fractal. So whereas I've got I've got the big N made of little ends, on the other one I've got an even bigger N made of smaller ends, made of smaller ends. I'll, I'll put a picture in here. There you go. And uh, you can, and then you can see how that works. So, can you tell I'm getting a little bit tired? My, my brain's not working properly. I'm so sorry. I wanted to talk a bit more about this kind of stuff. Um, so other things that I like to talk about here, I've got this, this is another scarf, which I made a long, 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 long time ago. One of the, about the third scarf I ever made. This is called the Sanka scarf. Um, and a lot of you will be familiar with this, but many of you won't have seen it. So I thought it was about time I resurrected this one a little bit. You can see all of these beautiful patterns, all of these charts just cycle through. They're all different until you get back to the end. So both ends of the scarf. Oh, my husband's on the piano. Um, both ends of the scarf have the same pattern here. I'm going to close the door just in case that's disturbing anyone. So you've got this pattern here which is the same here and can you see what's going on at the end? Let me tell you a little bit about Sanka if you don't know already. So the Sanka patterns, Sanka is spelled S-A-N-Q-U-H-A-R, Sankwaha, but it's pronounced Sanka, it rhymes with Tanka. That's better isn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm so tired. Um, so the Sanka um, patterns are a, Sanka is a town in southern Scotland, it's near Gretna Green where people used to run away to to get married and elope. Um, and the joy of these patterns, they, they're they very traditional, they go back hundreds of years and the uh, the Sanka tradition is is in not in double knitting at all, it's done in, in stranded knitting. And the, uh, so usually you'd have one of these patterns the most famous of which is this one. That's the why I've used it at the beginning and the end. So this this pattern's called the Duke. They've all got most of them have got lovely, lovely, evocative, uh, nostalgic names. So the Duke here is the most famous. And imagine a pair of gloves made with stranded knitting, black and white, um, with this pattern all the way over the fingers and all over the gloves itself, just in that one bit. They're so striking and they're so fabulous. They're ceremonial gloves. They are made for um, a, a yearly, a yearly thing. it's probably happening about now actually, it's called the Riding of the Marches. Um, now, traditionally, what this would mean would be that various people, the 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 Cornet and the, uh, I can't, you know, I can't remember the names of all of the different people, I'm so sorry. Um, but various, various people would ride around the perimeter of the boundaries of the town and protect their boundaries just to make sure there'd been no breaches um, and make sure that they were, they were still intact. And so the, the riding of the marches, they would ride around the marches um, 
checking for uh, the integrity of their of their borders and fences. Now that was done every year in the spring after the winter was finished, so it was time to get ready for the summer. And so they would just make sure that everything was done and they would always wear these gloves. Now, uh, they're still made, they're still done now ceremon ceremonially and it's still a big part of the tradition of the town. Um, and, uh, oh my God, something else there. that. Oh, I've got a little bit of snag going on. Make sure that's just gonna all disappear. Back inside itself, or is it just? A... I don't know what that is. I don't know. It's a bit odd. I'll check that later on. Um, and uh, what's lovely about the gloves is because they are done in the stranded knitting tradition, they have different elements of them, and I wanted to use those different elements as many as possible to bring together into this scarf, so that I could uh, pull together as many of the the traditional aspects of these gloves and turn it into a scarf. Does that make sense? So. The gloves always have a um, corrugated rib cuff and it's usually a decorated one like this. So that's not just, a, if I turn it over, see, again, with double knitting, of course, what you get is is the duality of the two different sides. What I haven't done is shown you what this one looks like on the back. It looks very different. So where you've got, this is, this is the traditional way you see all the Sanka patterns. Um, and this is uh, the, the reverse negative image of that. But I can show you the corrugated rib here. You can, you can much more clearly see that the white stitches here, these ribs down the center, those are pearl bumps, can you see that? Um, rather than knitted stitches, whereas on the other side, you don't see it so easily, but the black stitches here are the pearl bumps there. So that's that's my version of a corrugated rib in double knitting. Um, then the, the, uh, the gloves around the wristband above the cuff will always have a band which has the initials of the wearer, and that's what makes these gloves so, so just so beautiful i think so each one is individual they're all made with the individual uh, with the initials of the wearer and i've got n j g there because that's my real name and then because i do like the little bits of magic that double knitting can do usually n j g if you just sort of knitted it wouldn't would be on the way back, it would be all backwards. But with a little bit of careful charting and a lot of care in the knitting of it, NJG on one side is also NJG on the reverse. Isn't that cool? I love that. I really do love that. Um, and then you've got these different patterns as they work all the way up the scarf. Now, I was very, very lucky and very privileged to be given access to the the Tollbooth Museum in Sanka, which is where they have a lot of examples of these gloves. Um, but some of them are not on display and they gave me access to their archives and I was allowed to photograph them all. So all of these charts are taken from the gloves. I photographed them and charted them out myself. So these are from the originals, this is as close as I ever get to field research. Um, now, bear in mind that what, any a whole glove would be just one of these. I wanted to put as many of them together as I could. They've all got lovely names. There's the Glendine, there's the, the Rosen Trellis, the Drum, the Pheasant's Eye, the Shepherd's Plaid, the Prince of Wales, they're re the Duke. Really, really lovely names. Um, and they're just, this is, this is one of my favourite pieces of knitting ever. Um, it, whenever I take this out in classes, people haven't seen it before, it gets gasps of ooh and ah and people really really adore it and people say to me is that really knitted are you sure that's not woven it's like yes i'm really sure this is done with malabrigo sock yarn on very small needles maybe i don't know 3.25 something like that i can't remember i can't remember exactly what size i use but very very small um and it's so so lovely what's amazing about double knitting which you don't get when you are stranded knitting is the ability to be able to do this it's so, so stretchy, which of course you can't do with stranded knitting because of the floats across the back. That's where double knitting really, really excels. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, um, but that's the Sanka scarf. Now, I've got a whole load of stuff here, which I could talk about. I've got another pattern here called Il Barato, which is a similar sort of thing to this one. Now, the joy of both of these is that you don't really get bored knitting them at all because every there's there's a new chart coming along every now and then and with this one i've used four different colors um but again it's it's only two at a time because it's double knitting but it is it is just delightful all of these patterns came from a book called il barato um and they are 
this 15th century Italian needlework charts that I found and I've faithfully replicated from the originals as much as possible. Um, although in a couple of them I did find some errors, some errors in the, uh, in the symmetry. So I've changed a couple of bits and pieces to school. I can't help myself because I wanted to make them exactly accurate. And I just used different combinations of, of four different colours. And this one, rather than have a faux fringe on it like that one, I've actually put a real fringe on it. I think it looks rather smart. So that's Il Burato. And there you go, that's that. And then rather than just continue through all of my knitted stuff, I just, those, that's, I'm going to do a little bit of archive knitting um, in my podcast coming up because there's a good chance there won't be much knitting that's new to people. But if you're new to me, then you won't have seen this stuff before. So that's what I want to do. Um, but the thought, the last thing I would like to talk about this week is this bag. This bag, I call it my playground. Um, and I really, really love this bag. I, I call it my playground because it's full of scraps and crazy and nonsense. But this is my experimentation. There's so many things in here, which are br like brand new techniques. Oh, it's so lovely. That's really nice. Um, so many things in here which are which are new to me, or things that I've worked out from scratch, or things I've had to play with, um, and it's there's a lot of stuff in here. There's craziness going on, all sorts of different. Oh, I don't want to lose it all. Um, so many different swatches. This is the this is the chart that I use the little swatch that when I teach my double knitting classes. This is how I show how things are separated in between. Um, then there's experiments with double knitted brioche. Some of the earlier stuff I was doing. Here's some double knitted lace that I was uh, practicing with here, which is just absolutely gorgeous. And of course, on the other side, all the colours are reversed. Um, this is this sort of became. Uh, this was the swatch that kind of became this scarf here. Although this was an experiment in um, marling and double knitting and double knitted brioche. So this is uh, like Marlisle, the Anna Maltz uh, sweater spotter stuff here, the technique that she uses there. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of use Marlisle into double knitting rather than fair isle. So whereas usually you'd have yellow floats across the back here, what I've got is a, is a whole yellow square. Um, so that was all, it's, it's so easy. You can just, the joy of double knitting is you can always flow from one thing to another. I know this is like really disjointed. This was, this was my, this was actually my, my first Marlisle experiment. This was, I did, I did Anna Maltz's class with her. Um, and here you go on the, on the back, there's, this is the marling of the green and the blue together and here's where you go into the blue and there's the green and then you've got some little bit of pattern there but on the back as you can see it's got all the floats going across the back and that's what marlisle is it occurred to me while i was in the class that you could probably separate the stitches and and do front and back and do some double knitting and of course you can so there rather than having the floats across the back there you've got double knitting across the back there which is reverse colours on both sides. So that was what made me start experimenting with this kind of stuff. And that was the, the inspiration for this, although there's there's not much marling in this one. There's only sort of the odd square of it here. The other, the, the there's no, uh, see this one, there's, there's marling in between all the squares. I haven't done that with this. I just went from technique to straight to different technique. And that's what was going on with all of the stuff there. And here we've got, we've got mulled stuff, we've got double knitted stuff, we've got double knitted lace, we've got double knitted brioche in two colours, There's and there's Chris Stitch, there's all sorts of things going on here. Chris Stitch, for anyone who hasn't heard me talk about Chris Stitch before, is a, uh, well, I called it Chris Stitch. I don't know if I've made it up myself. It's a kind of, it's like a two colour reversible linen stitch done with double knitting mm -hmm. and it looks like this that's that's chris stitch there i think it's very very attractive um, whereas linen stitch doesn't look quite the same on both sides this one absolutely does and then you turn it over 
and there it is looking just as gorgeous. Uh, so that's that's what's going on there with that one. What else have I got in here? Oh, this is fun. So this is uh, what I use when I teach my Strantasia class. Now, Strantasia is a technique that I've come up with myself for adding a patch of stranded colour work. You see the nice uh, the snowflake there? Adding a patch of stranded colour work to one area of a piece that's knitted in the round. Usually stranded motifs will have to go all the way around or you've got floats having to count because you can't do it. So here you would probably expect to see another um, snowflake on the back. Well, there isn't one. What? So are there floats going all the way through? No, there are not. So that's, you can see is very clearly stranded work, but then look, it just stops and that's just just green knitting all the way around. So it's it's a way of being able to uh, add a patch of stranded colour work just to one area of a piece worked in the round. And I think that's really, really useful. I'd like to, if I hadn't been completely sidetracked with double knitted brioche over the last few years, then what I was hoping to do is design some some little motifs and things that you can put in the like the ankle of a sock or uh, on, the, on the front of a hat, which I do have, uh, I do have a Strantasia hat, which don't know where it is currently. I'll find that at some point. So that's that. This this crazy thing here. This is um this is the swatch that we do when I teach my um, shaping class in double knitting. So we we use lots of different increases and decreases, uh, and that's that's the swatch that teaches people how to do all that kind of stuff. Um, that was just a little bit of a experiments with lace. Um, oh, here's some double knitted bobbles. There we go, some double knitted bobbles. I did those a long time ago. So neat and tidy, I don't knit like that anymore. Um, <laughs> um, this is, oh, now this. I don't know how I did this. This is something I really would like to, uh, I'd really like to come back to this. So this is a, this is a Vickle braid. Now the Vickel braid, as I'm sure you know, is a, uh, it's like a, so you've got your columns of V's like this in your knitting. All oh, my English knitters are laughing. Um, um, <laughs> columns of V's like this. Well, a Vickel braid is where one column of V's lies down and you build up this column like that across the, the rows. Now they, always as you're looking at your work they always go one way of course the work as, as you're in the direction that you're working um i wanted to see if you could do vickel braid going the other way and it appears you can so it's going to be hard to see here hang on let's get some light in there so this bottom one here and you see all the V's are going that way. Whereas this top one here, all the V's are going the other way. How about that, eh? So you can, you can have your V's going in opposite directions. Now, I can't remember how I did it. <laughs> it's very attractive. I've, I've got a feeling I do know I think I did it on the pearl side, something like that. So I was working in the opposite direction. Must It must have been something like that. But it's, the Vickle braid is the one thing that escapes me in double knitting. I really, 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 really want to work it out. Um, and I should. I, because uh, theoretically there's nothing that you can do in single face knitting that can't be rendered in double knitting using color and reversibility. And I just think how amazing it would be to be able to have a braid in a contrasting colour or a striped braid. All of these things should be possible in double knitting. I've never had the, the, the chance to really sort of sit down and, and play with it properly, but I might one day. You never know. Um, what else have I? Oh, I've just stood on something sharp. Oh, I've got some broken glass down here. I haven't broken a glass, that's really weird. Um, so I've got other things in my bag as well. What else is in here? Oh, this is fun. This is a, well, it's like a little coaster really, or maybe it's maybe it's a, a 
Kippah, I've never seen a Kippah for Ben already. Um, so it's a, a little round piece of knitting like that, but on the back it's got a completely different pattern on it. Now actually this was never intended to just be a little swatch on its own, although it's rather nice and shows that you can knit coasters. What it is, is it's a way of demonstrating this sort of new decrease that I was doing, which is kind of invisible really. Um, it's it's really not far off if invisible, it's lovely. It's the, uh, it's the, it, it, basically that is that, and on the inside of this hat, it's that, and that's, so I should backtrack, should I? This is the reinvention hat, um, and it's called the reinvention. It's the first hat that I came back with when I came out of exile in uh, September last year. And I was experimenting with a hat which has two entirely different patterns on it. So you've got this one on the outside, but on the inside, it's completely different. Completely different. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It really, really is. I, I love the fact that that you can do this with double knitting. It's the same as the, the, the initials on the Sanka scarf. So there's all sorts of things there. <laughs> what I was, it's a, it uses the Al Nasi decrease. Uh, so the Al Nasi decrease is the one that I use in this hat. This is a column of Al Nasi decreases. And it means that you've got no spiraling. Look, you've got the segments of an orange, talking of which. Ah, zingy! My sense of taste is coming back. I can actually taste that. I couldn't earlier, which is great because I've lost my sense of taste over the last few days. Um, usually, on the arms of, of, of in a hat, you can see the the arms of the decreases will spiral towards the centre. They'll sort of go zip like a uh, like a galaxy. But this one, look, it just goes in like this at quarter of an orange. Um, and the reason for that, the Al Nasi decrease is so much fun. I've talked about it before, but it's uh, it's not a it's a single decrease, but it doesn't lean. It's completely symmetrical. It, uh, it has no. It's not a left leaning or a right leaning decrease. It um, it just goes exactly where you want. <laughs> Tired. Um, it's a three into two decrease. So you start with three stitches and you end up with two. So you've lost. You've lost one, but you sort of, uh, it, it's its so its so deliciously simple to work and so simple to do, but I was experimenting with it for the closure of this hat. That's essentially what I'm trying to say. And uh, what's very nice about it is it doesn't give you any spiraling arms. So you can just play with putting those decreases exactly where you want them to. And you get, oh, it's just, the answer with knitting is always yes. Isn't that beautiful? There's always a way of doing something. Um, what else have I got in my bag here? So this, I think I've shown you this before. This was going to be a scarf design, which I've never quite worked out how to do as well as I wanted to. So it's not, it's not, I mean, it's lovely. It's lovely, but there's, the problem with it is these, this gapping in the, in the decreases here. I, I was, Oh, I was just never quite happy with that. And there must be a way of doing There's, There's got to be a way of doing what I want it to do without it doing that, because I think this is a really, really lovely, lovely design. Um, and one day I will revisit it and see if I can tidy that up, because I think it's definitely worth it. Um, then there's this. This was... This was the beginning of a lot of fun. This, I was knitting this on the way back from San Francisco. I had Anna Maltz was asleep on a, on the flight somewhere else and I went and joined her for a little while. We talked about different things that could be done with um, double knitting and Marlisle. And I was trying to do some, some double knitted brioche as well. So, so this is like, you've got double knitted brioche and then you've got double, you've got Marlisle and then you've got the actual, the going into double knitting. It's, it's so, there's so much playgroundy stuff in, in this one swatch. I absolutely love that. And I played with it and played with it and just allowed it to be silly and, and do stupid things. Uh, that's not mine. Oh, here's, hang on. 
So there's also, this is double knitted brioche, and this became uh, this cowl. That's what was going on there. So I, I standardized that. And this is definitely going in the book, but this is where it came from. Absolutely beautiful. And it's not done with cables at all. That's all done with increases and decreases. It's just so, so lovely. I became obsessed with that texture. Um, and then, uh, so that was the beginnings of the brown and yellow thing where you see that the lines crossing over and working themselves into what you want there. More double knitted brioche experiments here. So we've got a um, like a one into five increase there. Can you see that there? One into five, one into five, and it's completely reversible. Yes, it's lovely, it's lovely. That's the joy of double knitted brioche. It can be completely reversible. This is very interesting. So it's hard to see. Maybe, ah, oh, can you see if I hold it up into the light there? Can you see? This bottom section here is double knitted brioche. This middle section from here to here is traditional brioche. And then this top section is double knitted brioche as well. And if I, can you can see it's very, it's very different. Um, I'm not gonna go into the difference, the reasons why, but you can see there's three distinct sections. That's, that's to illustrate the differences between double knitted brioche and ordinary brioche, then um, here we go. So here are some double knitted lace techniques. Uh, um, what's that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> uh, some more double knitted brioche here. There's all sorts of things going on in there that I was trying to, to figure out. It doesn't look like much, but I can't remember what most of it was going to be. And then um, this, where is it? There we are. This represents a quest for something I need to revisit. I love this. It's not the design on the, uh, the piece of knitting that matters. It's the cast off. Now, this, what I was trying to do with this cast off is I wanted to engineer a cast off which was 100% symmetrical and beautiful on both sides. But look at that. If I can just, there we go. Oops. Can you see how we've got this beautiful edge where it's just a white stitch, a green stitch, a white stitch, a green stitch, all coming out of each other. Now, usually, when you've got uh, this is what a, this is what an ordinary cast off looks like. They sort of zigzag in and out of each other like that. And that's just not the same, is it? Whereas that is absolutely beautiful. And it is 100% symmetrical. It just sits there on the top of the of the knitting. Whereas oh, it's for me, that's a bit of a holy grail. There's not a cast on that I'm aware of that looks like that exactly. Um, although it, could, it potentially it could work, but I just think it's absolutely something that's so, so beautiful. And so neat and so tidy. I can't remember how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> What is wrong with me? And then what else have we got in here? Have we got anything useful in here? And I've got this sock. A little sockling I've made. Um, it's not striped because it wants to be striped. I was going to be starting to teach some classes about making socks, which is not really my bag anymore. Um, but uh, it's striped, not aesthetically, it's just because each of the different sections of the sock is in a different colour. So my cast on, uh, this is what the, I do the um, the old Norwegian or the German twisted cast on, which looks like that for socks, it's nice and stretchy because you know, it's what you want with a sock. Then I've got the cuff, which is blue, the leg, which is green, then the uh, the heel flap, which is blue, the heel turn, which I did in the green, and then picking up in the green there. Then we've got the gusset in the blue, the foot in the green, the toe. 
there in the blue and then I kitchened it in the green so you can see exactly what a kitchener graft does on a blue sock. So that's just a good illustration of what's going on there. So that's, that's a, I mean, there's lots more rubbish in there as well, but that's my, uh, that's my playground. And I would be devastated if anything happened to this particular bag full of tricks and loveliness because, oh, and here we are, this is some intarsia, of double knitting intarsia within within um, double knitted brioche and then some syncopated brioche. That was my first experiment with syncopated double knitted brioche. Um, so there's various things in it. Oh, there's another thing I wanted to show you as well. Um, here is, it's a piece of double knitted brioche where I've changed the colors over in the center. Can you see? It's hard, you see what I mean? So there's a square in the center where I've changed the colors and that's, that's not something you can really do with traditional brioche. So. Uh, I'm hoping that that's a, a fun thing to experiment with at some point. Um, and this, this was an experiment in Kitchener with different colours in double knitted in double knitting. So to be able to change the colour, so you can have the colour changes go right up to the edge. So this is purple all the way to the top red to the top, purple to the top, turn it round and you've got red to the top, purple to the top, red to the top. Um, and if you can see how you've got purple on one side and it switches to purple there and then purple there. So it's all it's all possible. It's all really, really possible. Um, and it's all done in one go. It wasn't done in sections. So that, that for me is a really important aspect of, of double knitting stuff. This was one of the beginnings of uh, a shawl design, I was trying to work out how to cast on. It didn't go according to plan, but I thought it was well worth keeping. Um, and this, this rather strange squiddy type thing here, well, this became the crown of a hat. I'm not gonna talk to you about the crown of that hat this time because I think I've burbled on for quite long enough. Um, I hope you're well, I really, really do. I hope you, have enjoyed this burble. It's been really random. It's just been chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. I'm totally aware it's been a little bit crazy and a little bit strange. Um, I'm going to try and do some minimal editing on this one. I don't want to sit there doing thousands of things because it takes so long. I just want to get this up and out because it's now Monday. Don't forget on Thursday at uh, 8 p.m. UK time, Thursday the 26th of March 2020, um, head to my Instagram account go to the link tree link in my profile and then click on the Zoom meeting link there and then and you can come and join me and hopefully many, many others and we can have a lovely, lovely time. What I would like to do is I quite like to uh, make it a little bit less hosted by me than the last one was. I wanted to make sure we included people, but I would just like to, it's just kind of nice sometimes to sort of sit and chat with people. Um, and it was, What's really, really lovely is people, we could, um, you can use the chat facility in there and send private messages to each other. So you can always make friends with people and, and then meet off Zoom as well if you wanted to. Uh, I'm very happy for anyone to be doing that kind of stuff and use me as a little meeting hub place. So that's essentially all I've got to say this time. It's plenty enough, isn't it? Um, stay well, stay happy. Don't don't worry about me. I'm, I'm very, very well. Um, we do live in challenging times. Um, I'm hoping that the world will learn from all of this and learn what is important. I think that's, that's for me, the most important lesson we can have is, is that people, community, kindness, friendship, embracing, celebration, tolerance, all of those things. These, these are inclusion. These are, the, these are the things that matter most at the moment. Um, and I really, really, in a weird way, look forward to seeing what will become of it. The world will have to change. We will have to, things have changed. You can't go back to before. And I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how we can make change for the better. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much all I want to say, really. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for being part of my journey ongoing. I really, really do, as always, appreciate your support. If you are new to Sock Petition Podcast and you want to go back, there's a link at the end of this video, which will have the playlist. Um, you can start watching them all there. Um, let me know how you're getting on. 
I do love hearing from people. Um, let me know how you're dealing with your isolation, if you're in isolation. Don't panic buy stuff. Don't interrupt the supply chain. There's enough there for everybody. Just be a decent human being and uh, and and don't just go, well, I'm all right, Jack. Leave some paracetamol on the shelf for other people. Somebody might need it more than you do. If you really need it, take what you need. But if, if you don't, be a decent human being. How about that? And I will bid you adieu. And I will see you on the next episode, which will be the 77th, even though this is being billed as 75. Uh, this is the 76th episode, and I really am burbling now. I need to stop talking. With all of my love, hopefully see many of you on uh, Thursday, if not see you on the next edition of the Song Edition podcast. Until then, while this podcast most definitely is now a finished object, remember, life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. Bye-bye. <laughs>Again, don't worry, the podcast really is over. I've just popped in, however, to say if you enjoyed it and you want to make sure you never miss another episode, why not click on this handy little subscribe button right here? Don't say I never do anything for you. Or if you're worried that you might have missed out on some really fun stuff from previous episodes, I've got a playlist link for you here, which has got all of the previous Sock Magician podcast episodes on it, so you never need to feel out of the loop again. Bye for now.